Welcome to the Bronx Aerosol Arts Documentary Project. Today is Tuesday, April 25th, 2023. My name is Pastor Crespo Jr., Research Librarian and Archivist here at the Bronx County Historical Society. I will conduct this oral history with pioneering writer Butch Two. Butch, would you like to introduce yourself? Greetings. My name is Butch Two. I'm from the New Graph Nation, Bronx pioneer. Been doing it for a minute. Now, let's say 1971 was where it all began, junior high school up until today. I am a member of that first element of hip hop, Scrappy or Aerosol. Um, thank you. Great, great. Today, we have the distinct honor of documenting an oral history for Riff 170, a true pioneering writer, style master, and artist. Welcome, Riff 170. Please introduce yourself. I'm Riff 170. I'm a aerosol artist slash poet slash athlete. And um, my podcast, if you want to check it out, is called Not the G Word. And you'll find out why when we do this interview. Great. We like to begin all our oral histories by asking you, if you could please tell us about your family history, their background, and where your parents are from. My, my mom is from Norfolk, Virginia, and my dad was from New York. But um, my mom is Native American, partial, and um, my dad is Black American. Uh, I have, I had 11 siblings in my family, but now it's like, only seven of us, seven of us still around, and I'm like in the middle of the set of the eleven, so uh, I'm not the youngest, but you know, we had a great understanding. My mother always used to say, "This is a family. This is a tight knit family." So that's what I believe in. You know, family recognizes each other and try to do for each other, no matter what it is. You know. You try to make sure that everybody comes together as one, regardless of what situation or what output comes along. You should always try to look out for one another. Great. Uh, can you tell us the type of music your parents listened to at home, that music that influenced you? My parents listened to all types of music, especially um, R&B, which was soul music at the time, and that's what I grew up on, like Smokey Robinson and the Miracles, uh, the Isley Brothers, uh, the Temptations, the Escorts, you know, and so on, uh, Marvin Gaye. Uh, you can keep, the list is very long, and she also listened to uh, uh, Strange Fruit from a Tree. She had her, a lot of her albums. I, I really liked the Billie Holiday's album. And uh, a Strange Fruit was just so touching and so uh, just reached deep inside you and you could almost picture what, what she was singing about. So music, we're more than music. Music is us and we are music. So no matter what anybody say, like most people say, we're a part of hip hop. No, we're the first element of of a culture, and hip hop adopted us because they, you know, most of guys like me and Faze did flyers for them, so that's why they adopted us for for our art skills. And uh, you know, talking about your parents, uh, do you remember any favorite meals? You know, something that reminds you about home. I remember a lot of favorite meals, like. This thing they call succotash. You put everything in there, like you put peas, you put lima beans, and you make it, you okra. And I didn't like okra <laughs> because it was so slimy. I don't like slimy stuff. I don't like egg yolk. I don't like anything that's slimy. Mm. All right, can can you tell us about the neighborhood you're from in the Bronx, and what are your earliest memories of that neighborhood? I was from 138th Street, 136th Street and Ryder Avenue. 
down near um, Mitchell Houses. And right it was this one block that was like a dead end in the coal mine was right across from us. And uh, our window overseeing the coal mine, you used to see them, the coal, the trucks, uh, the conveyor with the coal, just dropping the coal in the, mine, in the place. When we used to go in there and play and get filthy dirty <laughs> with the, by the charcoal from the coal mine. But um, it was, we played everything from a bit of box ball to Ring Olivia to Johnny and the Pony, Red Rover come over and uh, Skelzies. And uh, we played a lot of things, but it was, we played stick ball. We played stoop ball. We played box ball. We ran track. We did everything, you know, that a kid was happy to do. And it was a nice community. Everybody knew everybody from one end of the block to the next end of the block. Everybody knew everybody in almost every building on the block. You know, you was raised by your parents, but it's... It takes a village to raise a child yes. and to raise them right. So my mom is not one of them ladies that are like, oh, don't touch my kid. If you did something wrong, you got checked. And when you got checked, you knew you were going to get checked when you went upstairs too. So it was it was real. So you knew you had to have manners. We was always taught that. Great. Yeah. Can you describe what life was like in the Bronx growing up in the late 60s and the early 70s? Life was wonderful. Like I just said, you just you was just a kid having fun and being taught that you needed to learn so you can uh, further yourself. And uh, if you, you know, it wasn't like you was forced to learn. You knew that you had to learn in order to be uh, a part of society because society was growing and things were getting more quick paced in life. And if you didn't uh, try to, you know, do your best, you would fall between the cracks. So coming out your apartment and hitting the sidewalk, can you describe the sounds that you're hearing in the early 70s growing up? What are you seeing? You see the cars going by, um, people talking outside to one another out of the windows and uh, people looking out the windows and watching you and telling you, you know, I got my eyes on you. And if you do something wrong, you know, I'm going to tell your mom, but not before I get you. And you knew everybody had a great love for one another there. So that was the number one thing. Right, right. Do, you, do you recall or were there any gang activity in your neighborhood? Was there any no, at the time, it was like my brother was like, uh, he was like one of them guys, like a butch in case. He didn't take no tea for the fever, my mother would say. Like, you do something, you had to deal with him and my other older brother because they didn't play. My oldest brother, he went to the Marine Corps and he went to Vietnam and... Uh, he just passed away about three years ago, so I don't know if it was from being in Camp Lejeune or what, but uh, his name was Butch Bird, and uh, you know, I'm sad that he, he passed away, and so did my other brother, Ice, known as George, and he didn't, um, he tried to, you know, like I said, a family, he tried to make sure he was, um, if you did something to somebody in my family, he was the one that stepped to you to let you know that ain't how it's going to go. Yeah. You know, I mean, could, could you take us through the schools that you attended and tell us a little bit about each, you know, any any significant memories or, or buddies and friends that you had in elementary school, middle school, and moving on? Like the first school I attended was PS31 in the Bronx. It's now, it was supposed to be a historical building, but they let it get dilapidated now. They knocked it down and the big building is there. They put up a high rise over there because they let the building get so deteriorated that they had to knock it down. Especially when Sandy came because it ripped off sides of the building. And uh, 
we left it like really dilapidated. And then the junior high school I went to was Clark Junior High School for a little bit, but then we moved. This is at 149. 149. Yeah. Yes, Clark Junior High Clark School. And yes. That. And then from there, I went to Arturo Tuscanini on 165th Street, in, between 165th and 167th. And that's where I had a lot of fun. That's when I really was playing basketball and uh, doing the art. But I became an artist only because I, I used to watch my uncle draw and um, I used to read a lot of comic books and I wanted to learn how to draw. And he told me I could do one better. I could teach you because if I draw for you, you never learn how to draw. So, and that was the beginning of my journey of being an artist. Right. And uh, so did you take any, uh, you, you mentioned taking uh, art classes, you know, no, did, you know, you didn't, you know, I didn't take no art class. Everything I did was self-taught mm -hmm. because after with my uncle teaching me and me uh, reading different art books made me uh, become more proportion with what I, when I was drawing people, as you can see, I, if you look on my page, you'll see, a cash man and you see the way he looked like he's on the side of the train like he's dancing but he's really walking right right do you remember when you first saw writing where was it was it in the staircase school or where, was it the trains the first time i started seeing writing was on the buses when i had to take the bus to school and um and uh I didn't know what it was, but the reason I got into it because I was in the schoolyard 104, right behind where I lived on 170th, between 170th and 172nd, and uh, we was playing ball, and uh, I met these two brothers, Chris and Bonanza, which they're not here, no longer here, because both of them passed away. Wow. But they, uh, they asked me, did you ever go motion tagging. I said, motion tagging? What's that? They said, we can show you better than we can tell you. Go ahead. What is that? Tell us what motion tagging is. Oh, motion tagging is like you get on the train and you tag the inside. So the train is moving. So that's why they call it motion tag. Oh. Right. So the train is moving and you, you're looking around, making sure nobody's going to grab you or nothing. And you start tagging. And, uh, the first time I was tagging, I was tagging a different name, and it was in Riff. It was a uh, stack of one seventy, and then uh, I kept getting different names, and that's why I, I had so many because I I had to get something that fits me. Because Bonanza and Chris told me, "Yo, you gotta get something that describes you as a person." and uh, they said, every time we go somewhere, you always reading books or a paper or something. So you got to get something that really tells that's you. And I seen this commercial come on on TV, Riff, reading is fundamental. But I like an even number, so I added a, a, a fourth letter. Riff, reading is fundamentally fantastic. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people really liked it, especially when I met Faze and I told him that's what it stood for. And he was like, so amazed, he said, like, Shorty, you can hang out with me. And I was like, wow. After Chris and Bananza said, you can't talk to them guys. Those are the, the, the echelon of the culture. And they're going to they're going, they're going laugh at you because you just starting out. And so I went over there. Oh, they took me up to Clinton. I went over there and I, I, I introduced myself to Faze, too. And he said, so what you tag? And I said, riff. He said, riff like riffing off at the mouth or riffing like on an instrument. I said, no, riff like reading is fundamentally fantastic. He said, dang, shorty, that's deep. And everybody in the place looked at me like, yo, what did he just say? Yo, how old are you? I said, I'm 11. They was like, wow, man. He said, you got an old soul, brother, for sure. Because that was deep that you said that. And he said, what do you want to get out of this when you when you start doing it? I said, I just want to do the best work I could possibly do at all times. 
not just get up. I want to be special when I do it. And that's what made me who I am today. Can you tell us a story about when you figured out I'm a writer, when you first became a writer, and what was it that captured that interest in you? Was uh, everybody started uh, saying, dang, you know, I'd be seeing his tag everywhere. It, the Fs look like S's, so that's why they thought it was wrist, R-I-S-S, -S, but it was riff, R-I-F-F, -F, and I had to break that down to him, and it's like, yeah, your, your hairstyle is kind of unique. What made you do it like that? I said, uh, my cousin is Creeper, and he was uh, he was doing it before me, and uh, I like I took a letter from him, and uh, I just um, took the I, did, I didn't want to do regular Fs. I wanted to do something that was more flowing, and I I did the Fs that look almost like S's. And that's how I got my unique style, because everybody had to have their own original hand style, because that's what makes a real writer. Great, great. I'm, I'm going to turn the the rest of the questions over to Butch, too. Butch, you got some questions you want to ask? Yeah, let's, let's talk graph for a minute. <laughs> um, really? what, what, what did you use to write your first tag, and where was it? The first tag I tagged was uh, on my uh, on my floor on the top floor of the building where I lived in 1430 Plimpton Avenue, and I tagged in the hallway, and uh, I used a dry mark, which is a glass marker with you can screw the top off, and it has a little felt tip, and you can fill it up with ink, and the ink that I prefer was Flowmaster ink because they had all these different flavors and colors. So, and they had these, like they had the old pages that would, you could write on the window and it just looked like it just stood off the window. And that's why I really, and, but that's what made me um, write and um, what made it even more so because B Chris and Bonanza and them was already veterans of this and they, they really liked it, my hand style. And that's what, showed me I was on the right track and had the right ideas. Yeah, where did where did your uh game go after this the small the small market did you get with the the, the lighter with the the the, the, the no, race? You, then did I you got a shoe pods. I got this thing they call uh Absorbing Junior. And it had a retractable tip, like like we does with the markers. You press on it, and the fluid comes to the top of it. And uh, it was a, a, a ointment my mom Thank had in her cabinet. And uh, I just looked at it, and I kept when I was rubbing on when I get an injury when I plant when I'm playing ball, I used to rub it on to soothe the injury. And I just dumped it all out, and I oh, took man. it and I filled it up with ink, and I seen it work great. And I was like, wow. And nobody knew. They was like, did you make that? I said, nah. And I didn't tell nobody what it was because you didn't want everybody to have the same idea you had for sure. So yeah. that was my first marker after the the dry mark. Yeah, that's interesting because I never heard of Zorbean. I know what you're talking about, though. <laughs> Zorbean Jr. Yeah. with the little pad. For yeah. pay. It's like the... That pain stuff. That was the first pain stuff they had. Yeah, and it had like a felt tip, yeah. like the markers, yeah. like but they had a net felt tip, like right. a round. Uh, what other tags have you written? And do you still write any of them? Yeah, I wrote Worm One Six One, Boy One Seventy, Cash Two, Crunch, Mister Six, uh, As Two, Boy One Seventy, Real. Hill, um, Dove 2, and Riff 170, to name a few. Yeah, I think you started a movement with the Dove 2. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody came with the D2. Everybody had to have a D2. Uh, but what, what brought on those names? Was it the sound? Did it represent something? Uh, was it the lettering? Uh, 
what 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 inspired those names? The names was unique, and they they had a kind of a upbringing in your household. The dove was the soap. That's where I got that from. The dove two soap. Okay. It was supposed to be like one of the purest soaps at the time. So I call them, I was a purist because I was talented in making myself a mark with my own name, and I chose that one in cash too because everybody is all about the cash and uh boy 170 because that's what i am i'm a young man right so i use that and stagger because uh i went to see uh exploitation movies in uh in the 70s black exploitation yes mm -hmm. and uh when the guys in uh superfly was called stagger Oh. And I liked that name, so I, I I used it. Let me ask you, uh, 170, is that, what, what is the significance spot? Is that's, tell me about 170. 170 is like really uh, the corner of the block that I lived on, of Plimpton. Oh, okay. And uh, I didn't start out writing 170, I started out, because I seen another brother's name named Raby954. And I started out writing Riff 1430. You're building them. Yes. <laughs> and uh, then my mother seen my tag and she knew my yeah. handwriting. And she's like, You out there writing on these buildings? I said, That wasn't me. <laughs> Who, me? Not me. And uh, I told Bonanza, I said, Yo, man, my mom passed by that tag. Go, go, go right over it. And he went and wrote over it. She said, I thought I seen it was your handwriting, but it wasn't. I was wrong. Mm. And I was like, I got off the hook that time. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was like, wow, I got to be careful. So I changed it to 170. Why 170? Why not 168 or 149? Because I didn't live over there. I lived on 170th, so okay. you took the I, street name. Yeah, I took the street number of where I was from. All right. I hear that. Uh, tell me about the, the writer's bench. Did you go to the writer's bench, and why was the bench so popular? I went to the writer's bench only because Phase 2 named it the writer bench. Mm -hmm. Phase 2 was sitting there, and that's where we would meet up when we wanted to meet up when he would come from school right. and I would meet him there and then it became a thing that people would see me in phase there and yeah, other people the started getting yeah. off the train and seeing us and they started parking there too and talking and you know because I was like uh, not bragging or not trying to suit myself up I was uh, a real influential uh, writer at the time and people was following things I did and I kind of noticed that when I did my marshmallow style then I seen other people were doing the marshmallow style. Started a trend. Yeah, so I knew that that meant I was kind of special because people was taking ideas that I was doing and using them. So Faze was another one. People, he would give out uh, tag styles to different people and different ideas and uh, I guess a lot of people felt that we were the two uh, major parts of the tree and everything else branched off of it. And um, that's what we hold ourselves as the t first two original style masters before everybody else started really picking up style. Because uh, as Butch can attest to, I started doing things off my letters that made everybody want to do the same thing, like things that they call a hammer and pieces that look like it was chopped off. They, I called them doodads. And then uh, hanging out with Billy, he picked up that word doodads. Mm -hmm. And uh, then I changed the name to chips because they was chipping off your letters. So, but... Other guys like Case called them bottle caps because they resembled like a bottle cap. Right. Some of the things I was doing and some of the ideas. So that's the thing that made me kind of exclusive because I was always coming up with something different. I didn't want to be have simple letters anymore. I wanted to have something that jumped out at you. I wanted you to be able to go, what the? You know, and um, that's who I was. I wanted you to be amazed at what I did.
not just look at it and say, oh, I've seen that before. I want you to go, what the hell is he doing? What's wrong with this guy? And that's what I got. Because one time we were sitting at the writer's bench and my top to bottom tiger stripe rolled in. And everybody was like, whoa, look at you see what you ever did? And this businessman got out, was getting on the train and he got his suitcase his briefcase stuck in the door looking at it. He stepped back to look at it and the briefcase got stuck and he was pulling it out and then the door reopened and he stepped on the train but he had stepped off just to watch it. He had and that was the thing that I wanted. There, and everybody looked at me and I looked at them and I said, that's what I'm talking about. That's what I wanted. You wanted to shock people. And he was in shock but he was amazed at it the way, the way he stared at it. I think uh, a lot of guys started coming to the bench because they knew you guys would be there. Yes. So now they start showing up with black books and, and, and stuff like that. And, and then if they don't see you, they see somebody else. So now they became a whole big movement. And they asked if, if you could sign their book or yeah. you could give them some type of idea to do. And that's how that started. You know, each one teach one. Right. All right. So, uh, what lines did you hit? What stations did you get into for layups? I hit a lot of lines. I hit the four, the five, the six, the three, the ones, the twos, the D, the A's, wow. the B's, uh, the E, the E, E, the F's, um, the C, C, and the C because uh, those, I liked those trains because the CCs were the coal miners, and it was hard to write on them because when you spray the paint, yeah, when you spray them, it would absorb the paint would absorb in like a ghost. You look back and you just spray your outline. You're going to fill it in. You turn around and it's gone. You're like, what? Yeah. The, what? I got new type of paint? Yeah. Ghost paint? Yeah, right. <laughs> it was like Casper the Finley Ghost. Right. You know how he did. Vanish. All right, so give me uh, one of your favorite spots. One of your favorite episodes, and give me one of your uh, my favorite, favorite chase scenes. Oh, my favorite um, spot was the four line because I lived off right off of Jerome Avenue, so that's why that was my major line right there. And that's the first line that Chris and Bonanza took me to was to, to the fours on Jerome because we lived right up the hill from there, so it was easiest to get there. And it was, uh, it was, I liked them trains because they were flat surface and it was. You know, further admitted. uptown, like what, 183rd? Or, where were the layups? The layups, oh, they parked all over. Oh. They parked at 170th. Oh, right there. Right like there. Like when they, when the, they were called the, they were called the pull in and pull outs because we had the Yankee games and they used to uh, park them there and that's how you could get them. And early in the morning, when they had uh, football games, they were parked there because Giant Stadium was also Yankee Stadium. Back then. Yes, right. back then. Polar Grounds or something. Oh, that, no, Polar, that was before that. Before that. Yeah, way this before that. This way. is when, uh, when they, uh, this is in the 70s and the early 60s. Okay. All right, to talk us through getting into and out of your most challenging, dangerous tunnels. I heard about that foyard. Then you have to go underneath Tracy Towers and skim the view. Yeah. But uh, we we climbed down from Tracy Towers. They had a stairway that led down from there that kind of made you able to look into uh, to the foyard. And uh, we would climb a uh, scale the wall from the, the stairway and climb in to the top to underneath Tracy Towers and uh, they had these long water pipes that right. were in these big water pipes right. and we used to, we used to uh, straddle the pipes and, 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 and go across the pipes and then drop down onto the train cars because the train cars was like probably like about two feet up from it, right. from the pipes, down from the pipes rather. And uh, we would drop ourselves down like we were stealth like we were ninjas and uh all that was exciting that's what made me really keep doing it because it was the 
the adrenaline that right. was pumping. Right. You know, it, it just was so exciting. Right. And um, if you're a boy, you know, you, you like excitement, so you right. you did the exciting thing, but there was also women that did it, you know, young ladies that wrote with us. So, you know, and that's like the Charmin 65s, the S-Pats, the Big Birds, the the Poonies, the Barmaids, the Stony, the Grape, 897. Uh, you could go on. It was a lot of ladies that did it. But they also climbed the fence just like the guys. Mm -hmm. they, they were like sort of like tomboys, Tom but boys. subtle tomboys. Yeah. They, they still had their feminine side to them. Don't get it twisted. Yeah. That's right. That's right. <laughs> I think they wanted to be with the guys that bad. Come yeah. on. We, we here. Yeah. We here. <laughs> Early ride or die. That's right. Uh, all right. Tell us about the flyers that you and, and, uh, created for Cool Herc and Copa Rock. Like Copa Rock and me, we were all athletes. Like I said, we played ball together. Even Cool Herc, he could jump out of the city. And, uh, Coco Rock used to watch me do murals in the schoolyard along with Apollo 5. And he used to be like, yo, Riff is amazing. You see the character he put on the wall with the uh, gazelles on and the shine on the gazelles and the shine on the gold teeth in his mouth. And I was like, wow, people noticed that. There are a lot of people paid attention to the details that I was doing. And uh, Coke liked that. And he asked me to do a mural in his house of him rolling the basketball that was on fire. And uh, if you run into him, he could tell you that story. But uh, he asked me, to, because uh, him and Herc were real good friends, and uh, Coke played music too, along with MCing. He was one of the first MCs that I ever heard. And mm -hmm. uh, he, um, he was a hell of an athlete too. But uh, he liked it, my artwork and he, you know, incorporated me into Cool Herc uh, party things by saying, "Yo, could you do some 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 uh, artwork on paper that says where we're going to be at and when we're going to be there and how much you got to pay?" And I I went in the house and started uh, doodling and seeing. I I showed him one and he said, "Oh yeah, I like that, but can you do a little something else with it?" And then I I started doing him and her and them back-to-back -back posing in different motions, and it took off from there, you know. And um, then um, people start going, oh, yo, you just saying that because FaZe did flyers. I said, no, nah, I was the first to do flyers. But FaZe made it, every time we did something, he would do it like he would make it one better because I did the mechanical as people would call my style and he made the mechanical even more mechanical. Mm -hmm. Like he took it to a level 10 times more than wow. I did. Wow. As you, you seen, you was there at the phase two show. He took it and he put all these vents and things in it that I never seen that he really made it spaced out. In the beginning, he told me, Yo, Riff, that ain't going to work because they ain't going to be able to read your name. I said, I don't care if they can't read it. If you were writing, you should be able to understand it to a degree. So that's why I kept doing what I did. And then he joined in. He started going, oh, that's kind of, I, I kind of like that now, you know. And he took off with it. I mean, he made it even more exclusive. Wow. It's like right now I got something that I, I talked to him about and he made this this these beads for us all the people that was really tight with them have something like this not these two oh, yes okay. each person has a different one but this is mine because he loved the asian text and uh he like uh like it had different characters on it and everything and he made it out the wooden beads because uh he uh he said that's what most stuff was drawn, worn in in Africa yeah. and different places like Wood that. Carbon, yeah. Mine was the first time I introduced them to him. I had hematite and mother of pearl beads when I was showing him what I was doing when I when I moved down to Virginia. I started doing jewelry myself. Wow. So he started doing these and to let you know that you really knew him. 
everybody that really knew him had one of these, a different style, but one of them. Right. All right, can you tell us some stories about some of the DJ, some of the Hurt Jams? Oh, the jams were crazy because I went to a jam and uh, Sasa was there along with Trixie and uh, Trixie uh, was one of the, one of the, one of the most talked about dancers along with Sasa. But the first B boys, yes, the Go ahead. the number one A boy and B boy was Sasa though because I know. Trixie started doing moves and he took out a fake dildo and started dancing <laughs> around doing the Charlie Chaplin like move and then. Um, Sasa spun around and threw on these glasses with, with the mustache and turned back around and had some scissors and he cut the fake dildo off and everybody went crazy in the party. Oh! <laughs> and I was like, wow, that was... And Sasa had these like rubber band leg moves that was just unbelievable the way he, he make his legs wiggle and he like go, almost go close to the ground and still spring back up. But, uh, Every time he had a, a, a Herc had an event, he would tell, he said, mm -hmm. he wouldn't even say B-Boys. He, and he wouldn't say uh, uh, the word for them dancing was called going off. When it was time to go off, that's what Herc could say. He wouldn't say B-Boys, come on. He'd be like, it's time to go off. And he would put on a, 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 a record, a, a break beat that everybody started getting noticed all 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 b-boys would kind of notice when they hear that beat no matter what it is when they hear all the drums or the horns they would start getting ready to get to the floor and clear everybody clear space for them and they just do their thing and go off and that was amazing you know and phase was one of them he he would do the up rock and he had these Things like he could do a kick up, like like you know, like a karate guy. You fall on your back, you just throw your body up and land on your feet and spin. It was a lot of guys that did a lot of amazing dance steps. So uh, uh, contrary to what a lot of people want to believe, and not to be uh, a splitting people up, but I know most people say. didn't go to. Uh, Hip hop parties. It was mainly a black thing, and not to be saying that we uh, they didn't learn it, but they didn't come to the early parties. They got in and started getting into it later. But in the beginning, it was all us. You know, just like we're writing, they were there, but the best writers were all brothers. No disrespect and no trying to say, you know, and the best writers came from the Bronx. So, uh, you know, me, Butch 2, uh, Tracy, uh, Phase 2, Cost, uh, Bot, Don, Solid, the list goes on. I could keep naming people, but we ain't got all that time. I just want to name a few to let them know that, you know, I'm always thinking of them and they're my brothers in arms for sure. That's right. Okay, explain your mechanical style. Where did the inspiration come from? Like I said, I just wanted to be different, and uh, I didn't name it. Believe me, like I didn't name the doodads or the or the chips. People named it. They they came up with the idea. They was like, oh, Riff is doing like this mechanical. The letters are going across each other and going through each other and under and over and connecting. And all these things jumping yeah. off of it like right. spider legs and everything. So that's who named it. Plus, it was like a stiff style. It was more. I took. I left the marshmallow style. I went to a harder style, a hard edge style. And people kind of named it mechanical because it looked like architecture. Mm -mm. And that's what people were saying. You know, Riff is like he's just taking it somewhere else. Mm -hmm. And that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to be different, like I said in the beginning of this. And I, you know, I, I put my best foot forward. All right. Uh, did you walk us through your process of doing a piece? Do, oh, you, pl do you plan it out in detail in black books first? Or do you wing it? Do you get help from others? Of 
the crew. No, the way I did it is uh, I would go and uh, I do mimes on the spot. I just think of something that's running through my head that I, that I was thinking of when I was at home sketching. Mm -hmm. And then, like Faye said, you couldn't bring a paper there because that would discriminate you. So everything came off the dome. And uh, when I did my thing, like when when I did the 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 muscle car, every everybody was dead. It was like, yo, what the heck is Ruth doing? All them colors he's putting on the train. What's then when they seen it, it's like, oh my God, he just did a car, and he just uh, off the dome. He just was putting colors together, and look at how it came out. And that was my fir the first uh, legacy that I built off of that, just going off the dome. And it was a lot of people there when I was doing the car. So like people like Fuzz, people was on the pipes, people was on the top of the train, people were standing behind me and checking out what I was doing, along with Pell was there yeah. and other people, mm -hmm. you know. It's always, you know, it, we didn't always go with a lot of writers, but at that time, the four yard was really that was, that was spot. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, did you use characters in some of your pieces? You just mentioned a car. Yeah, I used the character. I started the first black character on the train, which was the guy that looked like he was dancing, like I told you, the cast two guy. But the first one I did was a guy with pointing his fingers in the cannon, was a, lit up the cannon, and the cannon oh. blew out my name. And everybody was like, wow. The cannon, yeah. But the first person to do a cannon was not me, was Staff 161. With a, with a stick figure lighting the cannon uh -huh. with a torch. What you call him? And the I Grim took Reaper. It. No, he did the Grim Reaper with different. That oh. was different. He did the the stick man lighting the torch to, uh, to a, uh, a Civil War cannon. Mm -hmm. What I did, I took a battleship cannon uh, gun and, and put it like, and uh, I had a guy with sparks coming from his hand uh, shooting off the cannon to make my 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 idea. And everybody was like, whoa, see, that's what I'm talking about. River is crazy. He took it five steps better. Mm. And that was the first character I did. But I also did top to bottom profile faces that were uh, that even Butch can attest for that was uh, that were characters and they were always all black characters. Mm hmm I remember that. Uh, tell us about your first experiences racking up, hitting paint. The first time I ever went is with uh, Chris and Bonanza, but I was kind of nervous. But at the same time, I watched them guys, and I was like, whoa, I could do that. But, you know, you don't know. We in the store, and people are looking, but you don't know. Who's looking? So you you kind of nervous. Yeah. And uh, the person that showed me the best way to rack up was Ray B nine fifty four. Like I said, he was amazing. He knew how to rack everything. He took a little portable TV and stuck it in between his <laughs> jeans and walked out of a Corvettes with that. And I was like, wow. If he could do that, I'm watching him. And Tracy was another one. He was the master. Him and Maybe with a master's rackers. Because we, uh, Tracy would go in the supermarket right where you live and just come out with a cart full of food. I mean, a cart full of food like you went shopping. And we would carry up like four flights of stairs to his grandmother's house. And we, I would spend weekends over his house and eat. We had everything chips, uh, cookies, chips ahoy. Um, Cheetos, uh, cheese bits, everything, uh, bananas, uh, uh, every type of drink, uh, Hawaiian punch. Uh, how about a nice Hawaiian punch? Sure. Yeah. <laughs> we had everything from juices to sodas to water to milk, and we used to get all tricks. Uh, cocoa puffs, all types of cereal, and this is just for hanging out when we wake up Saturday morning before we go hitting. 
So, uh, you know, he was special, and he still is special mm -hmm. yeah. when he when he uh, when he comes down to earth. What, what kind of paint did you? What was your favorite paint back then? My favorite paint was none other than Red Devil. Yeah, that was like this paint that sprayed something like Belton and the other paint that I really liked that a lot of people don't remember and I got was Wiz on. It sounded like Belton. It mm -hmm. came out so smooth mm -hmm. and it just covered so nicely. And um, I even used metal for like car paint. Silver? Like no different colors. Oh, like. Oh. What about your spray can? I mean your caps. How did you did they come with caps ready or yeah they came to... with stock caps but some other person found out if you take stuff from niagara or easy off or or some type of oven spray Your that phone. it would spray spray bigger and it would spray about like this thick and then some paints came with the top that if you turned it sideways it sprayed this thick but when it spray if you kept it straight it was sprayed about this thin mm. and uh but you couldn't put another cap on that that was a total different paint mm -hmm. but um we we were smart we, we we used ingenuity and we we made things work you know we were kids but we also had brains and we did a lot of things we 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 um we all came with imagination yeah, because uh, that's what all art is, imagination. If you bring your best imagination, you can pull off anything. That's right. All right, I'm going to pass it back over to Pastor. Yeah, um, Riff 170, you stopped writing for a time. Tell us why, and when was that? I stopped writing because I was getting ready to get out of high school, and, you know, you go somewhere else, you don't want to go there with a record. So... I was getting of age, so if you get caught, you get a record. You know, they 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 take you, and they take you down to Central Booking, and, and they start fingerprinting you and everything, and calling you a vandal. Okay, we, I can't say it was okay for us to do it. We were vandals, but we were also artists because we made the trains look even more beautiful. Eyes, you know because they was letting the trains get rusty and everything, just like I said about the coal miners. You spray them, and it would absorb the paint. Right. And uh, I, I found a trick for that. I, I used silver, copper, and gold on the coal miners, and that's where I did my first burner on the coal miners, because that stood out on them. It wasn't absorbing in, into the train with that. So you had that, you know, you had to use your mind and see what would work for you. Mm -hmm. And that's what worked for me. Okay, great. There were a few names that you mentioned that seemed to have had a lot of influence on you. Billy, Chris, Bonanza. Would you break down each of those and the impact they had on you, mentorship? No, they was the mentors. They were like partners. They liked it being around me because I had different ideas and they would rub off on them. And, um, uh, Billy, he wrote Billy 167. He also wrote Bloodshed. 216. Yeah, and he wrote uh, another name. And uh, he was messing with Butch with the bees. And was he Silvertips? No, Silvertips oh. was another guy. Oh. And Silvertips was nice, but also Def and Crotchy and Bam. Crazy Five. Yeah, the, crazy, the original Crazy Five before they passed it on. And... Um, these guys were so uh, special, uh, had me as, uh, had me rated as such a special person that when I went in the neighborhood to play basketball and guys who didn't want us up there, they would step up and make sure nobody would bother me. Because back then, you know, it was still prejudice. You know, mm -hmm. we were black and they were white and they didn't want us in their neighborhood like we did we brought some dirty little secret or something but it wasn't true a lot of them a lot of things that we did they wanted to do and it rubbed off on them can you tell us about 
any mentors that you had in writing and the impact that these mentors the had? The only on. mentor I had to me was phase two. He told me the ins and out. Him, him, Bonanza, and Chris told me the ins and out of getting into the yard and when to be smart to go to the yard. And that's what Chris and Bonanza did, took me to the yard. And he always said, go with somebody. But me being hard-headed, I went a lot of times by myself. And that's why some of the pieces you just see my name and nobody else next to me. Because I that adrenalism just made me go. Mm-hmm. And it was like, I when I got an idea, I had to go there and put it out. And that's what I did. So what's going on with you currently in the art scene? You know, do you have any projects coming up? Give us a little update. No, I'm just doing artwork and uh, hoping people uh, like it enough to want to get it. And uh, I've done a lot of shows and uh, it's just up to the individual. Right now, I'm doing a sign for a guy in France that I got to mail off to him. And it's a a, a New York City uh street sign that says uh no parking but uh i spiced it up like a lot of other brothers that learned to do signs like scheme t kid butch you know uh it's different guys we we use everything we at our disposal we don't only do draw on paper you know we do walls we do uh vans, you know, if you want us to do a truck, we do a truck. We do smoke shops now. If you, you they invite you to do it, you want to do a smoke shop, you do a smoke shop and you use your talent to the best of your ability. But like I said, now it's kind of hard with the spray paint because they got all these special caps and I'm so used to using one cap or two caps that I got to learn to get adjusted to changing caps and knowing what what lines they make. But it's a lot of people, like the new writers, they already know what lines they make and yeah. how to use them. Yeah. So you got to re, you know, you got to reinvent yourself with things. Yeah. Can you share with us, and I've been waiting for this one, can you share with us your opinion on the word graffiti? What does that mean to you? To me, that means uh, uh, a disrespect, like or uh, a slap in the face, because that's like calling me a nigger. You know, that's just a word, but that ain't who I am. So we do this art. You can't name this art. If we do it, we name it. You can't take the initiative. Society took the initiative to name it graffiti when. They they thought everybody that did it was not uh, didn't do uh, horrible work. It was a lot of people that did amazing stuff. So we named it uh, aerosol writing because like when you go to school, you write your head and you write your name. It's called writing. So if you write in the alias and it's a name, it's writing. It's not writing a book, but it's still writing. People get it wrong and they call it uh, graffiti because it's on the side of a building or on the side of a train or something or on a wall or something. It's not graffiti. It's writing. And uh, I just don't accept that word because it's, like I said, it's a bad word to me. All right. Great, great. Just to switch up a little. Yeah, Butch, you got a question? Right, Right quick. So... Graffiti is more or less a version of vandalism. No, graffiti is a, is to scrawl and to scratch. When you look at what I've done and Butch 2 has done in Case 2, tell me if it's scratching or scribbling. Then then if you could tell me it's that, then then I can't say nothing. But you can't tell me that. And you can't show me that. So that's why I don't accept it. And if it was scribbling, why do so many people want to purchase it? Mm. So what does writing mean to you? And has your understanding of writing and the culture changed over time? 
Yes, it's changed because people just want to get up. People don't want to put their best foot forward here in New York. We used to be the capital. Now it's Europe. If you go to Europe, everybody's trying to put an idea together, you know, and that's what it was all about. Put an idea together, put your best idea out there and let people see what you what you can do and what, where it's coming from. So what does writing mean to you? Writing means uh, you're bearing your soul to a degree to show what, what you're capable of and uh, that you have a skill set and that you have a special ability that other people don't because there's a lot of people that could draw, but everybody can't do letters. And that's for sure. Right, right. In regard to the other uh, elements of hip hop, DJing, MCing, breaking, were you a part of that culture? And tell us about your experience. Yeah, I danced itself. a little bit, but uh, uh, you know, uh, I was a part of that culture because I did the flyers, and that uh, I helped it grow. So that's why I'm a part of it. You know, I was, I was, um, I was like. Um, like, like when rent, I was I was a rent a, a rent artist. They rented me out, even though I didn't get paid for none of the flyers. I did the flyers, but they still belonged to me. So when I asked her for the flyers and he didn't want to give them to me, I I didn't understand that, you know, because uh, I deserve to get my work if I asked you for it, especially if you didn't buy it from me. I I see you sporting. Can go. Can you talk to us about the b boy gear you wore? You know, what what was it that kind of defined you in, in regard to the hip hop culture in regards to gear? And it was the way you dress. Like all got, everybody when you went to parties, people wore Kangos, people wore um quarterfields. I had spring quarterfields, winter quarterfields, summer quarterfields, and uh we had Martinex, we had, I wore that. We had uh, alpacas and, and leather fronts and uh, double knit fronts. And we had gabardine pants with, with, with gabardine shark skin and uh, all knit pants that had different designs in them that everybody wore at the time. We had bell bottoms. We had boot cut, we had straight legs, and uh, we wore Lee jeans, Lee jackets, uh, Wranglers, Wrangler jackets, um, everything. We wore baseball caps from different teams. That was always a thing, baseball, football, you know. It was, that's, that was just how we wore that stuff. We, we made our own style. We didn't live for a style that society wanted us to dress. We dressed the way we wanted to dress, how we felt comfortable looking. Now, a little bird dropped me a note and said you were into poetry. Can yeah. you tell us about, you know, your your work in poetry and if you'd like, you know, you Give can definitely throw a verse if you know sure. to if you want. Not to put you on the spot, only no. if you like. Well, uh I did poetry because I told you I like to write, and uh, I used to be a shy guy, so the only way I could talk to girls was to give them a little taste of what I, you know, to, to woo them, like, your eyes are bright like the stars at night, your teeth are like pearls all bright in a row, my ebony princess from Egyptian nights walks once again, can you tell me what it is, how it be, is this what it is? Can we be what I want it to be? Tell me. Can you tell me my Egyptian queen? And that's just a little bit. I, you know, I can't put it all together because it just came off the top of the head. But that's the type of poetry I like. You know, it, it consists of, you know, uplifting, you know, the female species in uh letting them know what you really think of them, that you really appreciate them more than just uh, 
one thing. You you love the way they look. You love the way they smell. You love the way they walk, the way they talk, the way they move. So uh, that's the only way I could get my point across was being able to do a little poetry. What was it that gave you that poetry bug? What influenced you? Why poetry? Because any nice thing you say to a young lady, you could catch them either smiling or giggling or shying away from you. That's what got me into that. Made me even want to keep doing it and come up with different things that went together that made them smile. Back to the aerosol arts. Can you think of, do you remember what piece you made that stands out in your memory is most memorable to you? And where was it? I could say in Butch can attest to this, it was the tiger stripe because it was top, in the top foyer, to top to bottom. It was in the foyer and it was the first top to bottom I ever did. And uh, when it came, like I did like flames off the end of the letter to to accent it, to make it look different. And it was more like a softy style. It wasn't even a mechanical in it. And everybody, like, they jaw dropped when they seen it. It's like, oh, you did the tiger strike. Was it easy to, you did it in the foreyard? Yes. Was it easy to do top to bottoms? No, floor? I had to stand in between the cars because I was right. a little guy. Yeah. And I had to hold on to one side of the train and spray at the same time. So. It wasn't my best work, but it was legible and it was fly enough for people to really appreciate it. Right. right. So, is there any other thing you know that we haven't covered that you'd like to share in regard to your aerosol arts and street art career? No, I think that uh, I kind of covered most of the bases, but the best thing is like doing pieces with people, like when you uh, when you wrote with somebody, it gave you it gave you a level of knowing where you stood when you did your artwork, and um, I kind of always stood above a lot of people, not just bragging. But if you see my stuff compared to people, and you see my stuff from the '70s, because I never went past the '70s with my artwork. If you look at what I've done on the trains. It's all from the 70s, and it looked like it should have been in the 80s or the 90s. Can you tell us about your most memorable collaboration and who was it with? I think my most memorable collaboration was with uh, Pell Do It Well, and uh, we did, uh, he did a dime and I did a dove. Like Butch said, when I did the dub two, people was like, wow. Started a trend. Everybody <laughs> wanted to get a D name. Yeah. So that's why that stuck in my mind because Pell was like, girl, man, you trying to burn me, Riff. I said, I told you bring your A game when we do this. This is that's what right. I do. That's right. You know, I don't, I don't slack. When I come, when it's next to somebody, I'm going to do the very best I can yeah. at all times. I wanted to highlight that people are looking go, yo, I don't know why you wrote right next to Riff, man. That was a bad move. <laughs> nice, nice. Butch, do you have any uh, questions no, you want to ask? Just a couple of comments. Me and you never collaborated. I was surprised at that. On, That's what on, on, on canvas, on, on plywood, on trains. I think one opportunity came where uh, who had Vito? Vito and them had a, a, a train. Yeah, and, and you that, supposed to did that it. That we supposed to. Yeah, and Butch and never came had, through. Nah, don't, don't try to make it seem. <laughs> Butch never came yeah, through. Yeah, but, Not saying that I would burn them. He just didn't come through. I, I didn't want to put it on. That's all. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that was the only time I kind of remember that we were kind of paired. Yeah. And it never it never really happened. But I really wanted to write with Butch, but Butch was so him and Case were such partners that I I was in but trying no, to we, we, we had uh, for a long time, me and Case, we go to layup, whoever's there, we snap we pulling them right into our production. We had the Butch Cheeks and Case, Butch Case and Nine. It was a bunch of joints that we did. We we yeah, yeah, I love doing did. that. But I you know, Case wanted to go with me a few times, but 
no disrespect to him either, not because he's not here. Butch used to melt him to death. What? Then, I see what? Used to melt him on the train. Oh, yeah. yeah but then, I mean, but that, uh, that's up to his game. Then, yes. That you made game. him better because yeah, I kept that, saying that. that. You know, I would always say to that. To the point where he started to compare himself with you. Yo, yeah. I'm better. I said, but I told him, Case, if you think you're better than somebody, you prove it. You yeah. don't just say it. Get the pay. Yeah, I'm and, and, and bring me there. Bring me there. You didn't come to me when you had the chance. Right. You could have came to me. You know, I was in tandem from nobody. I was taking on all comers. But that's one thing about collaborations. Do not sleep. Bring your A game. Because you think you're just coming at night out, smoke a couple of joints or something, and the man is trying to. It's always underlying competition. Yeah, it was competition always, always because. No matter what you do, you want to show that you're capable of doing you're the best thing. You're on that thing. level, yeah. right. You're mm -hmm. on a level that no, nobody else is on. Right. And I always put that out there. I was on a level that very few were on. Great. We like to end our oral histories with one question we ask all the uh, narrators. Butch, you want to ask that question? Mr. Riff, what does the Bronx mean to you? It means home. I'm back where I belong, because when I moved away from New York and moved to Richmond, Virginia, I was missing this place. And I, when I got back, it was just like, I ain't miss a beat. So definitely, it's home. You know, it's like when you leave a place, you're kind of homesick. It plays in your mind, and it lets you know that's where you belong. Regardless, I don't care what nobody say. You know, it's it's harsh in New York now, but it's still home. That's right. Home is where the heart's at, for sure. Okay. Beautiful, beautiful. We like to ask all of our uh, artists if you can write. You know your tag. Sign in for no the archives. Problem. And I'll put for us any color you like. And I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna continue the recording and catch you in action. I put you these hard markers. That, that, that don't blame that on me. That was uh, the society picked those up. I'm gonna I'm gonna nah, go. That was faster than them guys, man. Some El Marcos. Yeah, El Marcos would have been nice. Sharpies are good. The tips stay uh, yeah. tight, though. The chisel, yeah. Yeah. That's going into the Bronx archives. We got uh, everybody signed in. We had. Um, What's his name? Uh, BG183. Uh, Coach came through here. Uh, uh, Dose. Yeah, Dose. Uh, I was thinking of the girl. Um, Rocky. Rocky. Olga was here. Scratch. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Oh, yeah, we didn't get nothing about the history, history or the, the origins of the independence. Yeah, I noticed that. I just thought about that. That's when I saw it. Talk to us about that. Talk to us about independence. Faze made that up because they, everybody else had a crew, like what you say, TFP. But before TFP, it was... Uh, it was ex vandals They had the crew, the first like kind of crew, but they got they they only became the first crew after the vanguards, mm -hmm. which were the first the very first crew. And then um, Faze made a a Bronx ex vandals but they treated uh, Lee One Sixty Third like a a food stamp when he went out to Brooklyn. So we felt that that was a diss that when he went out there, y'all wasn't even acknowledging him. So we uh, made our, Faze made his own crew called the Independence because each person was an individual and we all had individual talent. So the, what better than the Independence? Because you have your own independence. But he pulled top notch guys. Yeah, all and, the top guys. Everybody was trying to be down with yeah. that. Yeah. That, that was the hottest thing when, they, when he hit with that. 
So Riff, are we gonna get any worms? Any swaggers? Yo, yo, who who created the funky worm? Remember that? Me. Do a do the funky worm. Let's see if you still got it. Oh, the character? Yeah. No, the cat with the little safari hat. Yeah, Rich, Richie. Richie. Yeah, he. Yeah, I see. He started. He's painting again. Yeah. I'm glad for that. He 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 um he made the the character and I but I had the name so I I, I put the character on. What's your name? Right. Yeah. He put it together. Yes. I made the character famous. Everybody was trying to rock the worm too, with the safari hat. And yeah. The little, yep. So the IND show with the passing of uh, Lonnie, phase two, y'all decided to keep it going. Yes. But I was an original, one of the first original members, so you know it would only be right that I keep it. But only one thing I like about them, nobody's trying to claim president. No, there was no president. Lead. That's yeah, what I'm right. saying. Every, it's, it's a new it was thing. just a clue. Right. right. Display. There you go. With 170, we appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to come here and document your oral history. No, the but thank County. you for wanting me to even uh, be here to, to talk, tell my story instead of People are always thinking that I'm just bragging and boasting. It's just the truth. And Butch is a living proof of the truth. Yeah, you I know, was there. I don't have to front. I did a lot of things. You know, people say um, they did a certain amount. I, I never knew what amount I did because I, I had other names. I just did the work. So I can't say I had over 100 or 200 pieces. I just did. Now, only two or three people counted. I think you had the N. N supposed to have no, a million he was, pieces. He was a beast, though. You Blade know that. supposed to have a, a half a million pieces. But nobody really counted. Yeah. But they they, 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 they kept put doing that, though. After a while, it became a thing. How many pieces yeah. you got? I did a million pieces. <laughs> <laughs> That's a lot of pain. I mean, sure, when you can do 10 pieces with one can. And and could do that because yeah. he had a two-letter name. He wrote uh, Kill Three first, but he wanted to. And I, I, I commend him for wanting to be uh, different. He said, yeah, I'm going to do something nobody else is doing. I'm going to be the first real king. And he was the first true king of the subway. Mm. He did the... Uh, Stacks, nobody did stacks. He had in and in and then in and in. He had whole trains like whole, like ten cars and yo, he was phenomenal. Wow. Yo, he was the most prolific writer that I know of the subway era. Awesome. Riff one seventy, thank you so much. I'm gonna throw you a piece out, my brother. Peace. Thank Peace. you.